welcome you welcome to all biyamani atus my name is vinish saxena and i'm your host this is our third meeting and please note this event will be recorded so let me tell you just briefly that how this project started i have been interested in the spirituality and humanity for a long time i have a foundation which has two objectives first objective is to help the needy people in financial difficulty and second objective is <clears throat> to explore spiritual unanswered unanswered questions like is soul there is life after life there does god exist <laughs> i am a yoga teacher i am also reiki grandmaster i have been teaching yoga for a long time before it was in the gym and now it is on the zoom if somebody wants to join on it is on saturday 8 to 9:30 so <clears throat> when i look around i see many religions there are many spiritual practices like meditation or rituals prayer yoga all kinds of things people are doing on the other hand there are things which we cannot explain like simple thing just take where does the space end if you ponder in that question you will never come up with any answer <clears throat> there are other unanswered questions why some people have psychic abilities they can do mediumship telepathy all kinds of other psychic abilities and some people most of the people don't same thing some people go through near death experiences majority of them they don't some people are extremely rich some people are on the street so there are many questions like this so when i ponder over these questions it seems to me that there is a greater reality and this universe gives the flashes we see some flashes here some flashes there but we don't know the whole story just consider the analogy like if you see to see a, if you went to see a movie and if you saw few scenes from here there and there you have no idea what is going on in the whole picture same thing it looks to me to the universe so when we contemplate and ponder over these questions it i come to the conclusion that our objective is and should be to raise consciousness now <clears throat> this raising consciousness is a very long life long process and there are many ways to raise the consciousness and i will just share a screen here and you can go to my website so this is the my foundation which helps the needy this is spiritual questions this is yoga foundation and this is the yoga website and this is the center for consciousness development so this is why looking at all these things as i said that there is a greater reality and this reality we can call universal consciousness or god or whatever you want to call if we can increase our consciousness and tap into this 
universal consciousness, then we can be in a state of the bliss. We can develop intuition. Also, we can heal ourselves. So this is how we started. I started this Center for Consciousness, Consciousness Development. And its mission is assisting all people, assisting people of, of all faiths, beliefs, backgrounds, all diverse spectrum to improve the understanding of the universe, increase our awareness of the internal and external and develop consciousness. Now, as I was saying that there are many ways to increase the consciousness. And if we look at, I will not go in the detail. You can go on the website. Please go on the website and look. We can do mindful activities. We can engage in the other activities which will improve the awareness and consciousness. There are many things there. And we can have experiences, out of body experience, lucid dreaming and all kinds of things. We can also look at some practices which will raise consciousness indirectly. Also, we can do the reverse engineering, the effect of increasing the consciousness if we concentrate on those things, it will also increase the consciousness. Now, I'm not going to go in details here, but please go on the website. And if you have any comments, I will like to hear them. Now, without further delay, I will introduce Sujan Kem Campbell. She is a former school psychologist and a trained counselor. She has more than 30 years experience and she became interested in the nutrition and its impact on performance and achievement while working with the children. As a consultant, she has provided training in the stress management based on the nutrition and exercise. And she is very passionate to help people to achieve their goal. So she will tell us today the relationship in the mindful eating, how we can do mindful eating, how we can raise the consciousness, and how we can become aware of our body. As they say, you become what you eat. So being healthy and good physical shape is a prerequisite for the raising consciousness. So now, without delay, I will pass it to Madam Suzanne Campbell for now. So let us give her a hand. Wait, Madam Campbell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there we go. I, I find it a privilege to be able to um, be with you this morning and, and share my passion about nutrition and its impact on our um, mind, body, and soul. And when I was a little kid in school, we talked about health and all they talked about was your body, what you eat, what's good for the body. And so today I hope we can share and go on a little journey where we become more aware of how the food that we take in um, has a major influence on our journey towards higher consciousness. So I will share screen and hopefully, there we go. Can everyone see that? That's, everyone can see this? Yes, yes, okay. we're seeing it. Okay, yes. thank you, good. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes. So welcome, and um, we'll be on a little journey this morning. And uh, hopefully, if you have questions, we'll be able to um, respond to those. Um, your questions are maybe something new that I haven't that I haven't explored. So, 
uh, I don't have all the answers. I just want to inspire you to find your own answers through this process of um, good nutrition. So through my studies and work, um, I found that uh, each uh, plant, each tree, um, each fruit, um, each coffee bean um, are all endowed with an energy. And with that energy comes a frequency. With that frequency, there is spirit. And so I'm asking, are you connected? Are you connected? Do you feel the connection with the spirit of the foods that you um, take in each day? And maybe some tips on how we can get connected. Our busy lives have made us, fast food is so prevalent and um, that interferes with our ability to connect. This was uh, something that I came across, uh, a fellow that uh, has a lovely retreat center in Ontario. Um, but it sort of summed up much of the research that I had done. When we look at the different cultural groups and over time, man has always revered and thanked the great spirit, the spirit uh, or God, whatever you want to call this higher power. And so we found that every culture, every um, group had some type of ritual uh, that demonstrate that they honored foods that they ate, that they would honor something like this orange, they would honor the bear, they would honor that. And so these are not new. It's something to bring to our culture in 2020 that we can be on this path of enlightenment through the foods we eat if we take that moment to honor and get back to good, clean nutrition. So as we look at the development of um, our journey as humans here on the planet, as we um, early man ran around looking for food sources, they would go where there's water, where the water dries up and then go to another place. They would go to uh, a, an area in which there was food was plentiful. And then, um, and in that we have evidence that they, those early cultures had food rituals, that they recognized that there was a divine intervention, that there was some connection to a higher power through that. And we see that in um, some of the um, ancient uh, digs that the anthropologists have gone through. We see it in, in the um, Egyptian uh, pyramids. So we see that in, in China and in some of the areas where they have demonstrated that they had a reverence and an honoring of the foods um, at various times of the years. So um, the nutrition that different cultural groups took in, they vary. What we eat in um, Quebec uh, is different than what someone would eat in Florida, what someone will eat in um, Indonesia, just based on the geographical differences that we have in terms of what foods are grown. Um, so that becomes a really an important impact on the food intake and your philosophy around foods. So for today's man, um, for us, all of us, we have some big challenges because of the industrialization of food. 
because of the um, water resources and our, our water, um, we have issues around food intake. I don't see any evidence with primitive man that we had eating disorders. Uh, they were in a survival mode. Right now we have many, many people that have eating disorders based on this industrialization of foods. So if we are aware that this mind, what makes us think and what makes us decide cognitively, I wanna learn more uh, and our body, uh, and spirit, we connect. And at that point of connection is really, really where we begin to move toward enlightenment. And so nourishing spiritually our body and our mind, um, that brings us to that center point in our lives. So if we think of ourselves and... and I have to say that uh, um, we do th think as adults, okay, what am I gonna eat? I heard a comedian say the other day, gee, I didn't know when I grew up, I was gonna have to make a decision about what I had for dinner every night. Uh, because as a kid, it just appeared, mom and dad, food was there. If we were growing up in, in our culture, much different in some others, that, uh, as Vinesh mentioned, are deprived and don't have those. But if we begin to think of our physical body, that this is, um, is housing our soul, it is the home. We take care of our house, we fix our roof, we make sure that it's well-maintained, we clean it out every once in a while. If we think of our body as a sacred body and a house of our soul, we are going to take care of that. We're going to say, what am I giving my cell today? What am I going to feed those cells? What am I going to bring to this body that will keep it cleansed and keep it healthy and keep it clear and keep it connected? So as we nourish the body, we nourish, um, allowing us to move toward higher consciousness. Some of those industrial foods are filled with elements that really, really become roadblocks on our way towards higher consciousness. So um, today we're gonna to really look at this, connecting with that spirit, that power that comes from our sun uh, and it's manifest in us through the foods we eat. Um, we know that we need sun. Uh, our vitamin D uh, is the way in which our bodies can then transform the elements to create that. So connecting with that spirit. Sun is our life source and we may have back in elementary school learned a little bit of this basic photosynthesis, like how does the sun and the earth, those earth minerals, translate into a plant? It is amazing. It's an amazing transformation based on basic photosynthesis. And I remember taking my biology class at university and saying, wow, no matter how we placed the plants, they, they struggled. Uh, we would deprive them of the sun and they would struggle and seek the minutest little opening where there was sunlight coming in into our experimental boxes. So it's a powerful, powerful energy and desire for plants to be able to reach out to that um, external and it's external energy that gets converted internally. And if we look at that, when I eat something, I'm bringing in that source energy. 
So the sun is the, um, the power, photosynthesis is a conversion. And then we go through this bioenergetic assimilation. How about that? And as food scientists and food chemists have come up with all of the metabolic breakdowns of the food, each particular food has a particular molecular structure, um, the way the atoms and the, um, the structure is put together. We even know that certain plants um, are designed to give health to the intestine. For example, a lot of the research uh, looking at our bioenergetic architecture done by Dr. Beliveau and Dr. Jane Grau, where they look at those molecular structures of foods to um, really help us prevent specific cancers. So for example, when we look at the bioenergetic um, and the molecular structures of cabbage family foods, uh, all of those cruciferous families foods, they're molecularly structured to support good intestinal health. So it's an amazing, miraculous design. And it, I mean, I'm in awe every day when I think, when you stop and meditate on that, and it's like, wow, what a gift. And are we really connected with that gift and connecting with that light? And if we connect with that light, it brings us toward that universal higher consciousness where we have a greater empathy, a greater consciousness, a greater awareness um, of how we can interact with one another. So as we're on this journey to, towards enlightenment and higher consciousness, there's an energy transfer that takes place in terms of nutrition. Micronutrients are just basically um, all the plant chemicals. There are over 25,000 that they've identified. In the early stages of plant science and understanding, they were able to isolate 12, 13, vitamins, vitamin B, vitamin C, um, and with the greater technology, the more refined technology that we have now, they can take an apple, an orange, spinach, and they can break down and find those 25, 22,000, 25,000 phytochemicals, those micronutrients that are only found in plants they can synthetically, man, we figured out how we can chemically make vitamin C, how we can create the, a molecular pattern for vitamin B12, for, um, for, the, for the C's, the, the vitamin E, so that you can go in out and buy a, um, a multivitamin at Costco. But micronutrients are those carriers of energetic patterns those 25 phytochemicals that are in every plant um, here on, on the earth. Um, the other thing that's really a part of this divine plan is those micronutrients, as we take them in and eat them, they're naturally attracted to specific cell groups. As I said, those... Uh, um, molecular patterns of the cabbage family foods that are attracted to um, and support the intestinal health. There are others that are attracted to and support um, hormonal health or lung health or stomach health uh, or the bladder or the liver. So each micronutrient is really has a divine design and carries with it a vibration that will really match what you need energetically. 
So as we look at the spirit of food, to really connect with that, it's mindfulness, mindful that we're eating and what we're taking in has a role to play in my healing, in my health, in my awareness, in my journey toward higher consciousness. That I think as children, we don't always appreciate food that comes to us. I grew up on a farm, so I appreciated the work that it took to grow tomatoes, to grow the melons, to grow raspberries. I knew that it took a lot of work. And that moment of appreciation before connecting with the food that we take in is really, really important. And connecting, knowing that that comes to us through the love of a greater spirit of the universe. So um, I thought this was a great saying that Gabriel Cousins, um, and uh, I have a book that I will recommend to you. Um, I can put it in the chat maybe afterwards, but it's a great book on spiritual nutrition, energy. And he's saying that when we nourish ourselves with fresh raw foods, or as clean foods as possible. We have a, a great diet for maintaining health and well being and activating spirit. So, as we move toward the non industrialized food to a cleaner, more direct connection with food, that will help us achieve that. And I wanted to show a few um, images that I think are just really interesting and quite um, this Carolyn photography that was developed and they were able to find the energy fields, energy fields, auras. And when we look at food, People say, oh, there's no difference between organic or genetically modified. And look at the power of the energy of this organic mushroom. Just, just alive with power and energy. And when taking that in, you're going to be able to transform that. And that brings you into a state of higher consciousness. These are some other images of an onion. Um, these are little mushrooms. I, I just, beautiful. If anyone has any questions, then. So um, recognizing these powerful energy of the food, we can see that modern technology has allowed us to even photograph that energy. And I just want to point out that um, we can destroy some of that energy through the way in which we process our foods. So the energy fields with raw food, um, we know that it retains almost 100% of the nutrient value at that moment. So, and I'm going to, um, help you understand this just a bit. For example, let's say I, I'm eating a raw strawberry that I just picked. So the minute I pick that raw strawberry and eat it, I'm in, able to transform that, by, that vibration of the red. I'm able to transform the, the energy from those cells of the strawberry into, into my body. And I've eaten that strawberry just the minute I've taken it off of the, the strawberry vine. Unfortunately, um, and this is where I want to make sure, if I 
have that raw strawberry and it's been sitting on my kitchen counter for five days, it's already lost some nutrient value, but I will, eating it raw, I will retain what's ever left in there. The important thing about cooking is that if we're steaming, stir frying, or baking, we begin to lose nutrient value of the food um, through the cooking process. Boiling, and that's why they say, save that water, it's got nutrients in it. But the big one, and I think this has impacted um, eating patterns because it was a quick way for our industrialized foods to get heated up and we're losing the nutrient value. There are some um, countries in the world where microwaves uh, were not allowed, not because of some fear of radiation, uh, but because it destroys the nutrient value of foods. And we did some experiments with kids at school with water and you put water in a microwave, it changes the water and you let that water cool down and you put it in a, uh, you water your plants with it, your plants don't survive. But if you take water from the tap, your plants will survive. So you can try that little experiment yourself. Um, if you have a microwave, I hope you don't. Um, but here's a, a, a look at energy fields um, with cooked organic corn as compared to raw. See the power of the energy of raw corn. Now I do eat my corn cooked, I'll have to say that. But uh, just to show you the power of the raw tomato, for example, compared to the cooked tomato. The, this is steamed broccoli compared to microwave. Microwave will keep the color, um, but you can see the vibration and the frequency has been impacted. So when we're looking at all aspects of how do I truly nurture the house of the soul? How do I nurture um, my mind, body, soul so I can become more mindful, become connected and reach out? We really are looking at um, a, a global approach to nutrition, looking at what is it that I'm going to eat? What is going to help my mind, my body, and my soul? And if we honor the food um, and we have a relationship that is uh, positive with food, that will help bring us um, toward higher consciousness. And one of the things that's really interesting um, when we look at a research that was done where students were given a plate of food to eat, and this was a control group, and 20 of the students were told that they had to wait a minute before starting to eat the food. And the other group was told that they had it was still nothing. They got the food and they ate it immediately. They found that those that had to stop a minute before consuming the food placed in front of them, their saliva glands, they were creating more saliva. Um, they had a better digestion, so therefore a better assimilation of the foods. Then they reversed the group a week later. So those that ate immediately now had to wait. The same phenomenon they realized took place. So that even that moment of blessing the food, of any ritual before the food, there is a 
almost a scientific um, a little experiment that shows if you take a moment and what those students thought about, they weren't told to pray or meditate, but who knows, but perhaps they did have an awareness of they were going to enter in to almost a sacred journey. We forget that when we begin to eat, it is not just feeling our food and making our tongues happy, but that we're entering into a sacred process that was um, inspired by the divine. So um, we're going to do a little mindfulness, uh, being aware of what you're eating. Um, sometimes we say, gee, I had such a craving for a, a type of salad. Um, or I, some people say they crave chocolate. Well, if you have good dark chocolate, um, there probably are some good, good, we know, nutrient value in there that maybe at a cellular level, there was a craving. Um, for example, as a child, I said, I grew up on a farm. Um, my grandmother grew Swiss chard, which is very high in iron content. And I was a child that always tended to be uh, a bit anemic. Um, my hemoglobin levels were low and I was naturally in the garden, reaching out and eating this raw. So at some intuitive level, um, I reflect back on it now, my body was, was reaching out, getting the nutrients that it needed at that time. So I'm, um, Vinesh might not have asked you, but I, I, we're going to go through a meditation. And if you could go and get a, an orange or an apple or a lemon or some fruit, um, and I will take you through a meditation in the next couple of minutes. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to go get um, a fruit, an apple. I want you to connect to this energy that you see um, through that photo. Are we all good? Do you have um, an apple or an orange? Good, good. Everyone's ready? Yes. Okay. So we're going to go through this meditation and I would like you to just uh, close your eyes. As you hold this lemon or orange or apple, in your hands, I want you to just feel its energy, feel its power and its heaviness of its potential to bring you health, to bring you openness in spirit. This apple or orange you have in your hand started as a little seed. Would like you to imagine you're the seed in the ground and you're nourished with water and minerals. And the warm, warm sun is heating the earth and you sprout forth and you become a seedling and the earth, the sun inspire you. You are programmed to grow bigger and stronger and you reach upward and you have leaves
and that warm sun and the gentle rain coming down on the leaves and you grow and you grow and you grow. You're coming out of the earth and you become a magnificent tree. And the gentle rains and the sun and the leaves bring energy and your roots go down into the earth and bring the nutrients up to the leaves and up to the buds and the buds begin to grow and blossom and oh, smell, smell the blossoms, smell the blossom, that orange blossom, that apple blossom, the lemon blossom. that blossom became a little tiny orange or lemon or apple. And the sun transformed and brought the energy and the vibration into this apple, into this orange. And you can feel that vibration. And you can smell those blossoms. And we're all a part of this miraculous transformation of this fruit. Feeling the vibration, feeling the sun, the sun touch this apple or orange or lemon. It brought forth to what it is that you are holding in your hand. One would say you're holding the universe in your hand, the miracle of transformation. The miracle of the love of our higher power. The miracle that will nourish your cells. And so, as we meditate on the food in our hand and feel that energy, that energy that will be transformed. We take this moment to say thank you. And as we close the meditation, take the time and remember that this was made just for you. Okay, are we all back?
Did anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, yeah. One question. <laughs> yes. I live, I live in uh, Quebec, Canada. And I come originally from northern Quebec, which is pretty cold and freezing. <clears throat> so if you want to eat a lemon in February, uh, you're going to get a lemon from someone's a freezer that's been there for two, three months. <clears throat> uh, if you're going to get an orange, it's going to come from Florida, from yeah. Florida to northern Quebec. <clears throat> so I live where I live, where I live, <laughs> you are not going outside and picking uh, fruit and vegetables in the middle of the board here. Yeah. Um, so and the, the idea of eating uh, fruit and vegetables only in season, that means you're not going to live in Quebec. Oh, well, there are those that, um, and I'm not talking about seasonal eating, mm -hmm. um, but there are those uh, microbiotic diets are only eating with foods within a hundred mile radius of mm -hmm. where you live. Mm -hmm. um, that was, and you're, you're very right, that, that orange that I get um, in February, it has traveled and transported. And what mm -hmm. I like to meditate on then, it's Garland, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, my name is Garland. I like to think about all the, the spirit of the people that brought this to me. Mm -hmm. The person that picked this orange, the, the truck driver, the, the person that put it in a carton, the truck driver that drove the truck, um, the people at the grocery store that put it on the shelf. And if you think about their loving energy, and it might not have been loving energy, but I like to think about it that they participated in bringing something to me. It's, it's value from when it was originally picked is less for sure, but there's still value in there. It's diminished over time, but there's still nutritional value. And on top of that, it's been touched by human hands and I think a part of the Nash's um, mission is to let us know that the gestures that someone has, if they're, if the person that touched this, picked this orange was, a, I have a slide of someone picking oranges and they're happy, their happy energy, they're happy picking their oranges. And that energy, that happiness goes in at a molecular level into this, it's bringing uh, joy and happiness uh, to the, that whole uh, circle of process of, of food. So um, looking at it from that perspective, yeah, yeah. Is it possible to negate, uh, example, I speak excellent Spanish, I speak low in Spanish, and I deal with, uh, I communicate with some of the Spanish speaking people in Florida, California, whatever. And a lot of the people who pick these fruits, uh, excuse me, fruits, I think if you speak these fruits are Spanish speaking labor who are not all that happy when they're picking yep. these fruits, yep. right? <clears throat> so they're getting, they're working really, really long yep. hours. They're getting very small pay. Uh, their bosses yes. are insulting them. Now they're picking these oranges in a very, very bad mood. And then that's put into a, a freezer for a month and said to me, right. so how do I negate how do I, I can call it. I think you, I think you, you send blessings to the people that pick this. You send okay. positive blessings forward to mm -hmm. the people that brought this to you. Okay. Um, and, and I think that that's being very mindful. Mm -hmm. uh, they touched it. Uh, maybe they touched it with sadness. Maybe they touched it with happiness. We don't know, but we bless them for having touched it because that's how it got into my hands. So that's, uh, this isn't a perfect world. And so we, we work towards that. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. I don't have, how are we doing? We have still, uh, we should have questions, yeah. Uh, how are we time-wise? 
Um, okay. the we will have another five minutes of questions. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, yes. I have. Um, oh. oh, sorry. Go ahead, Linda. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Jocelyn. <laughs> uh, I have a question concerning the meat. Uh, what is the what energy is in the meat? Well, um, it, it it plant energy, of course, is direct from the sun, right? So meat that you eat, um, animal, they've had to eat plants. So it's a transform. It's very, very, it, you're three or four or five steps away from the actual um, um, energetic exchange from the sun with a plant, it's, it's direct. Um, whereas e eating uh, a chicken, the chicken ate, ate a plant uh, and maybe ate the grains of a plant so, or, or the grasses if they, our chickens used to run around on the grass. So it's, it's um, vibration of that, of the food from animal is totally different than the vibration from plants because the animal has ingested the plant and converted it to a protein that which you are going to consume as an uh, consume. So it's it, it's further away. The vibrational uh, pattern is is um, much uh, uh, separated from the direct. Uh, vibrational frequency that you get from a plant that's coming directly from the sun. Yeah. And uh, with the indust industrial, uh, all the suffering that they, they are feeling, the animals, what kind of vibration do we eat when we oh, eat? Very negative. Very, very negative. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that could, could procure sickness? Definitely, definitely. Okay. I have another question. You're talking about micro-owned. Is it, uh, are you talking about cooking food or when we heat food, the time that it takes to destroy the nutrients? Uh, is it uh, important, the time or we lose a lot of nutrients just heating the food. Yeah, either way, whether it's cooked or whether it's heated, the minute it goes in, the heating of it changes that, that molecular structure. So the nutrients have a different structural pattern at that point. Okay, yes, thank, thank you. you so much. It's very interesting. Thank you a lot, Madam Susan. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, you're Justin, welcome. you have a question? Uh, yes, we've been trying to, I mean, not trying, we did a, a raw diet for about two weeks. The idea was to do it for one month. And, uh, and of, what, after, of what diet? Raw diet. I mean, the, the raw. Quick. Raw. Uh, yes. Okay. Got, got <laughs> it. Thank there, you. There's so many diets out there. There's the Reynolds diet, the keto diet, the raw diet. Yes. The, and that's, raw, I, uh, we, 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 the raw, that there's it. a, a raw W H R A, it's an acronym for something. I came across that one because every you know I try to keep up with the research. And I thought, oh my goodness, yeah. So you try to that's that's tough to do a, a raw diet. That's yeah. Yes, and and the idea was to go for 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 a month, and I think ten days we like <laughs> we went back to non normal food. But uh, however, we can confirm that. Uh, uh, it's definitely there is uh, positive changes. Now, it's, it's what there is so many diet as you just mentioned, and sometimes you 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 the same one and the same diet, and you have one team saying it that way, and the, you're like in, in in so confused that at the end you feel like going backward. What? I mean, I'm sorry to ask the question that was the best diet, but if somebody wants to do a, a, a I'm, I'm a vegetarian, by the way, we don't eat meat. 
And but what's if I want to do a world diet or if I have to do the best diet, do we have an, an, a metric and evaluation possible? What? Yeah, I think how, how I, to proceed. And and I guess um I don't like people to to use the word diet because the first three letters <laughs> of diet. And I like to to think of a of a lifestyle uh, change and um it's very difficult to be um someone will say oh i'm i'm going to eliminate all the carbs from my my diet i'm going on a no carb diet well you know what this orange is a carb what people get all mixed up is to have that balance. And I think if you're going to look at nutritional intake, you're looking at balance. Um, raw potatoes don't taste very good. Uh, however, at least I haven't found a good recipe to make them, but I could have um, a combination. And what's important is to try to have as many um elements in your menu that you plan for the day, the week, that are uh, raw. You need legumes that are um, going to give you good natural proteins. You can't eat, you can't eat some edamame raw, um, but it's, you need a balance. I think, Justin, that's what I would say. It's a gift finding that balance. Um, you can go through 10 days and do a, a cleanse, and I'm not even touching on cleansing or uh, fasting. Fasting is important part of lifestyle. Um, we need to fast every day. And that means not eating after eight o'clock at night and not eating before six o'clock in the morning and allowing the body to have at least 10, 12 hour natural fasting. Our bodies were made that way to fast naturally. Um, and so when someone says, what do you think of fasting? I said, I've been doing it all my life. It's something we, we need to do in honor. Um, it's when we become anxious that we wake up at night and go to the refrigerator or go to the munchie cupboard and that breaks the fast. It upsets metabolism. It knocks our meta metabolic clock off. Um, so there are a lot of, it's balance, Justin, that I would. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. And may I, just one more question before. Uh, um, did, what do you think about the the one meal a day uh, uh, um, style lifestyle? Um, because that's this is when in the morning you just eat the fruit and you eat like between three to five p.m. and that's just for the day. Is it something? Uh, uh, what do you think about that the, the, that lifestyle? Um, it's too, how how big is the meal? Yes, I hope it's not very big. Yeah, I think I think you know we're all different, and if you have an, a, a health underlying health concern, such as um, uh, let's say you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, that might not serve you very well at all. We need to keep those blood sugars stable, and all of us do. We don't need spikes and 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 causing a strain on our pancreas to try to pump out insulin to deal with high sugars and lows. Um, again, it's a balance, Justin. I think the important thing is that the larger meal that one would eat um, should be midday and not the meal that you have before you go to bed. Um, we tend to in North American, European culture, eat a big meal at night, and that's not healthy. Um, if you're eating your, your larger meal uh, midday, that has a, a, an easier impact on our metabolic 
clock. Yeah, but uh, it, it's we're all different and we all need to honor that. And you need to um, ask those questions, Justin, which is very good. That's great. Thank you. Okay, one more question before the yeah, break. One, yeah, one question <clears throat> for psychological adaption with the, the rest of society. <clears throat> so say, I, say I, right now I'm living in the city of Montreal and I follow the diet you're talking about. So I've been, uh, I started to follow the diet that you're talking about. I do it every day. <clears throat> then I want to go visit my family. I want to go visit my family. So if I go visit my family in Northern Quebec, um, the diet you're talking about is next to not possible. It's really next to not possible. And if I walk into the house of my family and say, I'm vegan, and now I expect uh, you to do this, they're just going to get out of my house. So <clears throat> in terms of, uh, in, I'm in Montreal, living my life, and I'm, I'm following the diet you're talking about. Now I go into, I'm in a situation, I'm in a situation where that diet is not practical and literally not possible. So for two weeks, two weeks, I switch over and I eat what my family is eating because I want to talk to my mother, I want to talk to my father, I want to talk to whatever. And then when I come back to Montreal again, I try to switch back to the diet you're talking about. Uh, if you're a human being, unless, you're, unless you live in a... Um, a very, very closed society, a very closed society, you're going to be dealing with other people. And if you, uh, if you start telling other people, don't come near me because of this, don't, I can't go near you because I don't need this, I can't talk to you because we have to deal with other people. And uh, that, so, that's not, that's not, um, I, I, I don't think I've talked about a diet yet, but um, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the principles and, mm -hmm. and, you're right. I, I interfaced with people. Uh, I was with family in Michigan uh, mm -hmm. over the summer. I grew up on a dairy farm. It wasn't all mm -hmm. vegetables. So you're absolutely right. They're serving foods that um, I don't eat, but there are enough vegetables around the, the table. Um, and I, I always offer, I will bring, I'll bring something and I'm bringing salads if it's a, a, a shared kind of a meal. Um, and over the years, um, I don't impose my dietary standards on anyone. Mm -hmm. I share, I openly say, have you tried this? Um, my cousin had never had uh, uh, papaya and made mm -hmm. some beets and papaya and we had a great time so i think it's it's sharing with love sharing gently um i don't want to offend anybody if they're offering me foods and it's it's got craft cheese in it um i just gently say thank you um you know it's it doesn't settle well with me and that's the truth so uh, I think there are ways that we can gently and lovingly uh, share our journey and uh, be an example. Um, and people aren't going to change that much. Although uh, I do, I, you, you leave behind things that you don't realize. Um, so it's, um, it's the how we, we, we do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now, before we break, before we break for a couple of minutes, we'll do some ex physical exercise. Okay. Good. So we'll do Y. We will make a Y. We'll make a W. We'll make a L. I'll make a T. So Y, W, L, T. We will put the fingers on the shoulder. We'll make big circles. Ten times. We'll change the direction. <coughs> Thank you. 
we will hold the wrist behind the neck and go to the right to the left right left right left Good, we'll make a fist. <clears throat> we'll open and close fast. We'll make a thumb, put the thumb inside. Same thing. <clears throat> put the hands like this, rotate them. <clears throat> If you are feeling warm, this is a good exercise to do. Good. And we will do deep breathing. Take 10 deep breaths in, deep breath out. Good, so we can take five minutes break and we'd like to thank Susan for her presentation, but please come back in five minutes or even less than that. Okay. Good. Good. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
We are all back. So we'll have another half minutes, another 30 minutes of talk, and then we will have questions and sharing. So Susan, go ahead. Susan Campbell. Hello. You can hear me, Susan? Yeah, now I can hear you, yes. Okay, so go ahead. We will okay. have 30 minutes of talk and then some more questions and sharing. I, I'm sure you have more questions and I have answers, but that's all right. Um, this last uh, or the second part is looking at um, um, connecting with that vibration. And uh, I'm going to share a screen here. bringing us into harmony with every cell of our of our being and um <clears throat> some i guess i was just then was asking about a diet and i don't like to think of diets i like to think of a lifestyle of a mindset uh of being mindful of how you're eating um especially if you are seeking and looking towards developing a higher consciousness. So thinking of embracing um, as many raw foods in your diet as possible that are directly, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever eaten, gone to a garden and eaten a, a, a tomato right off the vine, how delicious that is. But that's one way of bringing um, uh, your body in line with those um, molecular structures that are gonna serve you very, very well. Another way is to think of the chakras and eating the colors of those chakras. So I will um, share uh, some of the um, information that I have, some of you are much uh, uh, more in tune than I am, and I look forward to your comments. But as we look at this screen with foods on it, um, there may be some things that we're attracted to um, just naturally. Um, for example, beets are a real important uh, part of my diet. Uh, part of it is because of a propensity for me to be a little anemic. So beets are, are it, it's part of the root chakra. It's keeping me grounded. Um, so if we look at color and thinking of what you're attracted to, this might be um, the body's way of saying, um, that a particular chakra needs to be nourished. We talked about every food containing its unique vibration uh, and energetic signature. It's, it's uh, now they're able to, to check those frequencies and they can see that. Um, they've even, um, a research that was done with trees where they put electronic uh, devices on the trees and they could feel the trees vibration and how they appear to be sending the vibration from one tree to another as if that were the way they could communicate. So we know that food has a vibration and an energetic signature. So mindful eating uh, brings us to higher consciousness and that uh, really is what I'm, I'm looking at finding things that are natural and fresh, <clears throat> minimally processed, clean, and that you are purchasing them, preparing them, and eating them 
with gratitude. And I think the gratitude is an extremely important element in terms of our assimilation in a positive way. So if we look at the root chakra, um, which really um, from a physical perspective um, nourishes is the large intestine, uh, our joints, our muscles, our bones, it's our rootedness. And if people are feeling, um, uh, I, I'd say to any of my clients, if you're moving, if you're physically moving from your house to an apartment or to a condo, um, I would suggest that you eat some red foods, um, such as beets and cherries and black beans and dark mushrooms and cinnamon to help you get rooted in your new place that you're moving to because that whole moving process um, is it can be difficult for people. So if you can get yourself rooted um, through eating some of the foods for the root chakra, that will help you. So any of the red foods, um, you can see the, can you see the image okay? Um, uh, of the heart. So the, uh, uh, your kidney beans, uh, any of those. If we're looking at the, um, sacral chakra that area um that is in between um the solar plexus and the sacral is orange and is it interesting that red and yellow make orange so that's why i always say in between the solar plexus and the root we find orange um, and that the bladder, the kidneys, the reproductive areas. And again, seeking out foods um, that are of orange color of that orange vibration, that color will nourish the cells of those particular systems um, that may need nourishing. And it's keeping it in balance all the time. And you don't just say, oh, I had a bladder issue. I'll just eat a lot of orange. That's good. But I really want to encourage you to eat some of each chakra every day to keep yourself in balance. So orange, carrots, turmeric, that's a great spice. Uh, um, and the solar plexus we're looking at the stomach, the gallbladder, your spleen, the liver, eating a lot of yellow, yellow squash, uh, corn, um, uh, yellow peppers. Um, and peppers, what I like to point out, green is a raw pepper. And the yellow, orange, and red peppers have to do with with stage of ripeness. And what they've done is they've gen genetically modified a lot of these peppers so that they um, uh, turn red quicker than if you just waited for the green pepper on the vine to turn red naturally. So red pepper, yellow pepper, orange peppers, those are all great sources for um, dealing with the solar plexus the, <clears throat> the uh, sacral and the root chakra. Great, great foods to get that vibration um, that's necessary to nourish these systems. A heart chakra or heart is green. And um, it's very interesting. I put a few out here, broccoli, kale, cabbage, Interesting, those are also good foods for the intestines, but they're good for the heart and the heart chakra. Celery, um, cucumbers, uh, green apples, you can use that. It will help with that heart chakra. Um, and that deals with that lymphatic system. Uh, when I say arms, 
uh, I, I love it. Vinesh has us doing exercises that um, are going to help as we sit with these this lymphatic system uh, that we find that are under our arms. So the thymus, the heart, the, the heart chakra is looking toward greens. And I love this. I found this image, which is so beautiful, um, of, a, of a, a cabbage. I would call it a, a Chinese cabbage, but it's just, I, I love this image um, to show the heart. And the, th there's a, um, uh, a slide. I didn't put it in this presentation, but it gives each food has its own signature image. Uh, like carrots are for eyes, <clears throat> as you take a cross slice of it. <clears throat> Our throat chakra. Um, it's one that uh, is nourished with a lot of blue. And every image I was looking for showed blueberries for nourishing the throat chakra. The throat chakra is um, um, also the chakra that that um, the thyroid is up in this area uh, of our bodies, the uh, taste, the smell. Um, so it, it's more than just the throat or the voice, um, but it does take in the senses of taste and smell, hearing, and your thyroid. And foods, <clears throat> you're going to want to use to nourish that are getting some blueberries, chicory, kelp, um, seaweed, some of those blue, I'm going the wrong way. When we look at um, the third eye, um, and one of the first times I had any real sense of that connection, um, I was sitting with uh, uh, a bowl of purple grapes, and they had just been picked. Um, I was in Southern Ontario where they had some vineyards and they were warm. And I was uh, sitting alone and waiting for someone and I was eating the purple grapes. And all of a sudden I could feel um, the, the, a throbbing sensation in my third eye. And it was, it was almost as if this was going right to that area. I was in awe and in gratitude that um, I had been made aware that what I've researched and what I've found that that I was given a sign, an awareness that yes, this purple grapes that we'd just taken off the vine five minutes prior and I was consuming and feeling this this connection it was very very powerful moment in my life and um, when we look at the foods that nourish that like the eggplant and the purple cabbages and um, some of those uh, blackberries Things that um, we don't often look towards in terms of helping us um, open up, and it, it affects these the, our brain, our neurological systems, hormones. And when we think of the crown chakra, um, which is light, light. The first thing that is comes through in a lot of the research is water. And from a uh, neurological or a, a nutritional um, perspective and even a dietary 
person will say the minute you begin to feel tired or lightheaded, drink water. Water is something that will help with the um, opening. It, it helps with making sure that your cells are balanced. Um, ginger is another um, wonderful food in terms of nurturing <clears throat> your chakra. And what I'd like to share with you and, and have you go away with that just because something is on the list that it nourishes the throat chakra or the crown chakra, the heart chakra, it nourishes other parts of our body also. For example, ginger um, is on the list of foods that are good in terms of opening up and, and nourishing the crown chakra. But ginger is also good for the digestive process, the digestive system. And I'm not talking about powdered ginger, I'm talking about fresh, fresh ginger. Um, coconut is great in terms of, um, we, we found that coconut oils and coconut, um, uh, dried coconut, coconut milk, fresh coconut milk, these are all good for not only the crown chakra, but for other uh, areas of our body in terms of nourishment. So don't just see it as, well, ginger is good only for the crown chakra. It's good for many, many. Um, and this is the, the chakra that connects all of our systems. It, it brings us to that higher light, brings us to that higher consciousness. So when we are looking at feeding the chakras, we're looking at feeding and giving the foods um, that we need to develop and continue on our journey toward higher consciousness and collective consciousness and awareness. When we look at foods um, that we take in, they're just some things, and I talked about it a bit when we looked at the how cooking changes the energetic. Um, uh, field of the various foods. We looked at the mushroom and the tomato and broccoli. Um, but one of the things, and, and I think um, Garland mentioned, is that yes, this orange that, um, or lemon or apple, that foods do lose their nutritional value after harvesting. It's just natural. Uh, it's a natural process. And it's understanding that um, we need to eat foods as close to harvesting as possible. And in our uh, world where the spinach I will get most of the winter, but not now, not, not this winter, not with my uh, indoor growing system, but previous winters, it traveled, it had a it travels from California or Mexico or Florida to get to me. So um, think that if you're getting fresh foods, don't buy two weeks worth at Costco. Get your fresh foods. Um, my friend in Switzerland who goes to the market every day to get her food, um, she doesn't buy in large quantities like we tend to do here. So I wanted to share this with you just um, to let you know that so much of the new research is looking at um, how do we prevent foods from losing their value over time. And I think this whole um, pandemic has put us into a mindset of how do we get a safe um, food supply. How do we get a food supply that's not going to 
lose its nutritional value. Um, and as I was saying, it was eating those grapes fresh uh, off the vines, eating the tomatoes fresh off of a vine. It's, it's amazing. And I love this little image of this child uh, experiencing eating the tomatoes fresh off the vine. So it's very challenging for us to, in today's world, um, get that nutritional value that we need. And, and these are just some um, citations, and we've known this for for over uh, 12, 15, 12 years now, um, that non-organic produce does have a lower nutrient content. And when we compare crops, um, and there are charts, and I didn't put that on today, I didn't think Sunday morning we needed a lot of scientific charts, but this just gives you an idea that we are losing uh, the soil. Um, the apples that were grown in, in uh, perhaps in senior stash uh, 50 years ago had a higher nutrient value than the apples being grown in St. Eustache today, um, just because of the nutrient value of the uh, earth. And I think that's where we end up getting all these fertilizers coming into play. So um, th that's an important thing that is impacting all the wonderful foods I mentioned that we need to eat with our chakras, that we have a decline in nutrients. And then with our um, industrialized foods, we have lots of neurotoxins in there. These are our roadblocks to developing higher consciousness. They are the MSG, all the flavor enhancers, your artificial sweeteners, all the chemicals of the sweet and low. And um, if, if you're going to use a non-sugar sweetener, and that's another presentation altogether, um, you would have to use things natural like stevia, something that's natural. So any of these artificial chemical sweeteners um, play havoc on our neurological system. The preservatives that are in foods. Uh, I did a lecture with high school students um, last year, and I had given, no, it's now two years, the last time I was in the, almost two years ago now, and I gave the kids foods, and I said, read the labels, and there were chemicals in there that are preservatives. They're chemicals that are texturizers to make sure that, that the texture of the Twinkie or the little uh, cake that they had uh, or, or cookies is similar through, is, is the same throughout. So all of these really do not help us on our journey towards higher consciousness. They are the roadblocks. They're the things that are impeding us from reaching a collective consciousness. Um, So in wrapping up, and there's some things, these questions that I want you to, to ponder, to think about how is the food grown? <clears throat> um, who harvested the food? Under what conditions? How was it transported? Is there a big carbon footprint? How clean is this food? Meaning, is it uh, been processed and um, so I'm now getting a potato chip in a bag rather than if you want potato chips, take a potato, slice it thinly, place it on um, some parchment paper, bake it in your oven and you have a potato chip, a roasted potato chip. You don't need something that's coming out of the bag uh, necessarily. Have you read the label? If there are words on that label that you can't pronounce, more than likely you should not be eating it. That the words you can't pronounce are roadblocks to your being able to develop higher consciousness. Uh, 
do you need this food? What cells do you want to take care of? You want to take care of your heart cell. You want to take care of your uh, cells in your solar plexus. Do you want to take care of your cells in your root chakra? Do you need or crave this food? And I think there is a discernment. Sometimes we crave something. Are we craving it because it reminds you of home? Um, I can smell that beef stew my grandmother made. So you're craving beef stew because it was brings back a memory. Or are you craving a food such as, uh, um, uh, let's say, ginger or an orange because your cells are saying they need some nourishment uh, from these foods. So trying to discern why you're, you're wanting something. So as we look at growing, and as I mentioned uh, over the um, course of the past uh, 20 months where food supplies, um, and we still have issues with the food chain, um, there are food systems being developed. Uh, some of these are hydroponics, some are aeroponics, and using land so that um, uh, we can grow vertically. And um, one that I'm going to be using this winter is a vertical tower garden. Here in Quebec, uh, I can grow my own spinach and snap peas throughout the, the winter and lettuces and microgreens. So finding a sustainable food supply that's safe so as you go through this process uh, of connecting with the spirit of the food you eat, slow down, um, go past the fast food, reflect on your choices. I didn't touch a lot on the environment, but choose an environment that you're going to eat. Um, I know we travel and we eat in our car. I try to, if I'm traveling between Montreal and my daughters in, in Collingwood, Ontario, I stop, I try to find a picnic place um, and, and not go into that uh, turmoil of the en route restaurants. There's, there's the buzz and the energy and, and try to find a, a, a place. And if you can't, bubble yourself so that you're taking in your food in an, in a, an environment that you've created um, to, to nurture the, so that the food coming into your body and the vibration of that food is as clean and clear as it can be. Um, be happy with the choices that you make. I hear so many people that say, well, I'm, uh, I'm on a no carb diet um, and they're angry about it. Be happy that you made a choice to have a good carb, which is an orange, or maybe you've made um, a beautiful bread. Rejoice in your choices. Your choice is not a burden, it's, it's a joy. And that will bring you to assimilating food at the cellular level that will give you a higher vibration. And then, of course, eating with gratitude. Um, however you manifest your gratitude. And so, the food choices we make become who we are because we are what we eat and we are what we absorb and we become that energy. So the energy from the earth goes into our energy and it's a cycle. And we want to be a positive part of that cycle. 
So thank you very much for inviting me to share my passion for helping others find the nutrition that suits them, that suits their goals and leads them toward the path of higher consciousness. So um, if anybody wanted to contact me, that info was up there. Did you get that? If any of you would like to reach out, you can check my website. Uh, you can contact me by email. Just say, uh, I met you um, through the Center for Consciousness Development. So we would like to thank Susan Campbell for informative talk. I'm sure that we can put some of the tips she has told us in our daily life. And now we have time again for the questions. And also you can share. If you want to make a comment, you can also yes. make a comment. Yes. Yeah. So please raise your hand. Yeah, Mira Trivedi. You are mute. Unmute yourself. Mira, unmute. You are on. You are on mute. Okay, I did. Okay, yeah. I would like to ask: As uh, uh, canned food have a, a date for uh, getting bad? Uh, uh, do the cooked food have a time period too? Uh, yes, and any uh, um, and 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 they talk about food safety. Uh, of course, there's going to be time time frames on that. Um, I'm looking at nutrient density. Over time, that food sits wherever it is, whether it's cooked or raw, uh, it loses its nutritional density, its nutritional value. So um, um, leftovers, uh, we all have leftovers, I'm sure. And just aware that um, I try to bring in some fresh food with a leftover that's been kept in the, the refrigerator so that I am getting as nutrient dense a meal as I can. Yeah. Okay, Mary, Mary Brune? Yeah, um, you haven't mentioned frozen food um, because we are living here in the winter four or five months where we can't get fresh stuff or it is coming from far away. Can you freeze your own? Excellent. And does it lose any value in freezing? Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, uh, when I work with my clients, I always talk about um, in the winter months, you're better off to have good frozen strawberries that you froze from Quebec. Uh, we have the best strawberries in the world. I think we do. I'm prejudiced. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure there are other parts. The strawberries really come from Italy originally. Um, but uh, if you could have gotten your own frozen strawberries, you're much healthier for you during the winter months than taking a fresh strawberry that's traveled from Mexico or California. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if it's, even if it's um, an organic strawberry, it has gone into a cold storage place then those cold storage transportation, uh, they have to, for health safety, they have to um, um, fumigate, they have to put pesticides down, they have to keep rodents away. So there are all kinds of things that those foods go into an environment that by law has to have certain standards. So yes, you are absolutely, um, you do use some nutritional value, but I try to, um, uh, when I freeze my strawberries, which I did back in July, um, I got my um, big cases of strawberries and I froze them immediately. That one whole day was just devoted to freezing my strawberries because I wanted them to be frozen as quickly after they had been picked so that we could capture the nutrients. 
So yeah. given a choice, say, between fresh spinach in the store and frozen spinach in the store, which is better? Well, you yes. can't freeze your own. Well, uh, let's say, I, and that's a question, let me put it in context. You're, we have a wonderful organization, uh, and there are a lot of um, um, fresh spinach being grown in Quebec in um, greenhouses and uh, that are organic. That is absolutely the best if you're comparing it to frozen. Right. Okay. But if you're taking an organic spinach that may have... Um, or just a regular spinach that may have traveled seven or eight, you know, thousand kilometers to get here, uh, you're better off perhaps with the frozen. But the frozen, you, you can't make a salad with it. You can't can't deal with it that way. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, so frozen does lose some of its value, but yeah, not as yeah. much as what you think you're getting fresh from the store, but it's traveled yeah. thousands. Mine. Definitely during the winter, I, I um, got wild blueberries from the um, uh, Lac Saint Jean area, and yeah. those are all frozen that I will use in the winter oh, rather than fun. buying the fresh that come out. Um, somewhere. If you yeah. look at, if even if you look at a strawberry, most of the foods have been genetically modified to travel. Therefore, they're hard. The tomatoes are hard. The strawberries are white in the middle. Uh, they're hard. I think people could play golf with it. It's <laughs> yeah, good. Thank so Linda, you, Linda. Unmute yourself. <clears throat> yes. Uh, what do you think about dehydrated food? Uh, uh, drying foods. Yes, that's yeah. a good. Uh, um, um, it, it's it's great if you. I, for example, I like to dry kale. Um, I uh, tear up kale um, leaves, I put that on a cookie sheet and bake it for uh, 420, four, 425 degrees and uh, makes a lovely stack. Yeah, so drying foods it has a, um, um, you lose the nutritional value that I would have if I uh, had that kale in a salad. Um, but when we were taking down our tar garden, I had so much kale, I couldn't consume all of that kale this week. So we froze some and we um, dried some because I like it for kale chips for snacks. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Linda, keep question short, please. Yes. Um, uh, uh, a moment. Uh, uh, when you grow the the your vegetables in the winter uh, or in in, uh, in the summer, uh, when it, it's or buy vegetables that are grown in water or or in binds, is it better in the in the 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 soil or in binds or in water is the same thing. Well, it depends on on how it's grown. Um, the The image you see behind me is my tower garden in the winter. Uh, it's a picture of it. Uh, um, that particular tower garden was developed at a university where it was developed at Epcot Center, but they did research on the quality of the produce comparing to the produce that's grown in the soil. And it had the, you know, that research was done at a um, the University of Mississippi Pharmacology Department, so the in their pharmacy department, and they were checking the um, antioxidant value of all of the comparing what was grown on the tower and what was grown in the soil organically. So there was. Um, um, no difference and a higher value of the one in the tower garden. So depending on which uh, uh, system is being used depends on, you know, the nutrient value. Do you I have a think. system to suggest? Yes, but I'll, I'll talk. I can, if you want to know that, um, uh, Vinesh, can you get me Linda's contact or put it in yeah, the, sure. the chat? 
Okay, I'll talk uh, offline now. We'll talk about it. Yes, okay. I would feel better that way. Okay. You, yourself, you, Victoria. Yeah, yes, hello, Linda. Thank you for a wonderful presentation today. Um, I just wanted to make a contributing comment, um, and that is that we don't always have control over how the food comes to us in these days. We don't have control how animals are treated, yeah. and we don't have control how our food is sprayed. Um, but we, 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 those are all how it's handled. And if we accept that humanity right now is in a is in a time of great flux and change and has its own challenges, that's why it's having trouble delivering things to us in a gracious manner. Now, having said that, one thing that we can be grateful and thankful for is that the natural life processes that are inherent in everything we eat, whether that animal has been abused or whether that that piece of that orange, that piece of fruit, you know, has been sprayed. The natural life impetus that wants to make it, as you pointed out, wants to make it grow, wants to make it flourish, wants to provide for us. That we can bring gratitude to. And if we bring gratitude to that essence, which cannot be changed by mankind, then everything that mankind does around that is just, uh, it becomes secondary and it becomes something that we can put trust in that our evolution will change in time. Yeah, th that's, that's true. Um, however, some, some of the, the things that we have put around food um, has a very negative uh, impact on our physical body for sure and um we've seen is well that, that's another the toxins that are there we have to uh, try to have as few as possible and i would hope we can move back to the time when we don't have all those pesticides and i remember my grandfather uh, on the farm um we used to raise sweet corn and there were worms would get in the sweet corn. And there was a salesman that came by and uh, I grew in a rural area, came by selling these pesticides that you were supposed to spray on your corn to keep it from getting these worms. And my grandfather, I can still see him, is very polite. He said, um, no, um, I don't want to have those chemicals on my corn. Uh, and if the neighbors want to have that, that that's their business. Um, he said, I'm sure I've eaten a few of those little earth corn worms in my life and I'm okay. So <laughs> he, he's, he, that was in the, I was a child. So that would have been early fifties and he, um, definitely um, made a stand and maybe we need to help others, you know, um, not want to use Roundup and things like that, that that are not being kind. Okay, any other questions? Jocelyn Sanyo was asking. Yeah, Jocelyn? Yes, yes, thank you. I, uh, the question I had was about the uh, frozen, but uh, did, um, I think Mary asked that same question earlier. That's why I didn't ask anymore. But uh, I'm, I'm going to, Suzanne, uh, there is a, in the first part of the presentation, there was a, an image where you show, um, for example, the, the, the two fruit and you can see um, the how shine is one and the other one. Um, um, can you, is it possible for us to know what equipment they use to be able to take those pictures? I, I, I always wanted to, to, to be able to do that myself. Yes, to, it's, to... A, it's um, a specialized photography. It's Kirlin. Um, yes. Kirlin photography. So how you, um, I met a group at an international conference where I met Vinesh um, they were from Spain and they were um, into that 
business of uh, doing that type of photography. Um, but I don't know. That's all I can share with you. I don't know. How no, no, that's enough. That's enough. Yeah. I will find it. And now I remember those. That's the same type of camera that they used to do the uh, people OA. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. If microwave destroys so much value, why does the government or anything doesn't put restriction? Good question. Um, I think the lobby probably for um, the uh, uh, industry that, that produces them was much stronger than any uh, scientists. I do know that in uh, Russia, they were banned uh, for a long period of time. I, I, and it might still be on. But uh, in the early days, the um, um, basically, uh, and I'm thinking just off of the top of my hat, uh, the technology was developed um, using micro, the use, the first microwave was called a radar range. They were using radiation. It was called a radar range. So um, a, a good question, but a lot of things get approved. Why does the government allow all these chemicals to be in the foods? Why does the government allow as Peter was saying, all these, these uh, chemicals to be um, used to, to grow foods. We, we Linda, have... you are the last, last question from Linda. Unmute. Yes, hello. Um, I was wondering, uh, you, the water is very important, uh, as you said, uh, but uh, all the chemicals and everything that they put in the water, what do you suggest? before drinking the, the water? Well, um, uh, if you're drinking tap water, as you might from uh, any city that you're in, I would suggest, uh, and what I do is I, I'm taking the tap water, I put it in a glass pitcher, and my glass pitcher is square, I don't have one with me close by, with a large opening. And that allows some of the chlorine to evaporate. So the chlorine um, goes away. Uh, at one time, I did have a, a filter, a water filter that I used. Um, so my drinking water was filtered um, before. Does it, does a Brita, uh, does the job? That does some, that does some uh, help, yes. So yeah. even when we put the the cover on it well it's designed to have the cover on it i yeah. i take the water and just uh let it the uh, chlorine naturally evaporate okay thank you you're welcome i could just add that um if you know uh, the, those those natural store like um april i mean uh, avril that's then one of those where this they have some very good uh, water filter yes, yeah. can help. Yeah, uh, thank you, Justin, that's true, yeah. We are approaching the time. Okay. Uh, so we would like to thank Susan for wonderful and informative talk. I'm sure she has given a lot of tips which we can put in our daily life. And we would also like to thank all the participants who joined us and our next meeting will be in four weeks on raising consciousness. So thank you all.